Hello, you're listening to the hatchetjob.com gaming netcast, and we're back after a few months away, and I'm joined by some new people and some old faces. So the old faces, we have Lupus Umbrus. Hello. Simplicitly. Uh, hello. And for new faces, we have Crutonic. Hey there. And Skeleton Frames. Hi. A while back, we all happened to be playing co-op games at the same time. And it struck me that that was kind of unusual, because normally we're playing a diverse range of things. Um, but certainly, it feels like co-op is kind of the, the new horde mode, if you will. Because, of course, Mass Effect 3 has come along. And I might, might be wrong, Cruton, you played Mass Effect 3, but I got the impression that that game is actually liked more because of the co-op feature than it is the, the rest of the gameplay, uh, ending notwithstanding. Yeah. Um, well, I had only recently finished the single-player game, and I thought the ending was kind of rough, too. Um, but the, the co-op is really where it's at in that game, I think. Um, it's a lot like Horde Mode from Gears of War 2, 3. I forget which one introduced it. I think it was... I don't remember. 2 um, introduced it, yeah, and 3 refined yeah. it. Right. Um, it's a little bit different in that between... Uh, between rounds, you can gear yourself up with better equipment um, that you get from the money that you acquire uh, throughout the missions. Hmm. Um, the the different classes that you can take um, provide some really interesting opportunities for for teamwork. Um, if you're so inclined, I happen to be not so inclined. I kind of <laughs> I'm, I'm like a really bad team member. Even though I love playing co-op games, I just I have no synergy with anyone. Um, but it's really, it's really quite a lot of fun. Um, there are three difficulty levels and what's really nice about that is they actually reward you for taking on the tougher difficulties, not in score, but they reward you in these space bucks that you can turn into better equipment, unlocking, uh, rare characters, things like that. Um, and they've had at least two, I think they just came out with their second uh, DLC pack last week. Um, I haven't played that new one yet, but the last one introduced some more weapons, some more characters, um, and along with the new characters, sometimes they have new abilities like biotics and essentially magic spells that you can mm. that you can cast. Um, but it's it's really well thought out. Um, the the three enemy races that you play against are are all pretty interesting and they play differently. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's an all around. I think it's one of the best co op experiences in quite a long time. It's interesting that you said that you are the kind of person who actually isn't very good with a team. Yeah. Because I I put a call out for comments on what people like about co op games. We've had some really quite detailed responses, which unfortunately I'm going to truncate and probably make them less interesting. So one of the common things that people want to see is that they want games to force people to play together. And so we had this reply from Rusty M, Red Sparrows, and Revan 8. And uh, they like games that force people to play together. And Revan 8 mentions Syndicate and Left 4 Dead, and also Horde Mode. And he says that the sh sharing tools of destruction also helps the fun, i.e. sharing a warthog in Halo. And what you said about the enemies, Crouton, chimes with something that Red Sparrows said and he said similar roles but interchanging an ability to defeat enemies or puzzles with each person contributing. Cruton, what do you think of the comments that these guys have made about games that forcing you to play together and how do you feel about that because of course essentially they're saying that the thing that makes our experience fun would be not having Cruton in the game. I wouldn't blame them for that. Um, I actually really like games that force you into these cooperative environments and I think that Mass Effect does it even more um, in that there are certain enemies that have like these layered defenses so I'm thinking about um, the Banshee for instance mm. which is um, which is one of the um, the Reapers uh, one of the Reaper bosses and uh, she's this character that has armor but also has this layer of barrier on top of her and different kinds of uh, biotics or spells can take yeah. care of those different layers separately. And it's rare that one character would have both of those things. Um, so that actually 
that creates a great opportunity for cooperative teamwork. Um, mm. So one person takes down the first barrier uh, with one biotic, then the other person sets them on fire, which does more damage to to armor. And with uh, especially at the higher difficulty levels, some of these bosses are really tough. Mm. Um, so you really need to have that kind of coordinated. Uh, attack and luckily you don't even have to communicate that much about it because everyone kind of knows okay we can't hit her armor until we take down her barrier first so we know that the person who has warp which is good to taking down barriers they're going to hit them first and as long as you communicate a little bit like oh here comes a banshee everyone kind of knows their 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 place oh bollocks is a person and not just an exclamation and he mentions that Frozen Synapse is it's a PC game, asymmetrical gameplay, be reviewed in Show 77, has, I think, a new piece of DLC which adds a shield to the game. And he, talking about what you said about Banshees requiring different types of coordination to bring the shields down, he said that what you can do in Frozen Synapse is one person has the shield, will kind of be moving forward, and then the other player will be uh, taking out threats from behind. And so this new piece of equipment actually forces cooperation or, or engenders cooperation in that way but i mean it's slightly different isn't it though in in mass effect or those games where you can choose classes because of course i assume the shield can be picked up with it by anybody but in mass effect you have to make a decision to build your character a certain way before you go in yeah that's right um so there are some characters that are kind of vanilla like the soldier which is really more weapons centric and they just do direct damage uh mostly and they tend to carry heavier weapons and in mass effect the more and heavier weapons that you um that you carry the slower and slower the recharge rate is for your spells or your biotics um so what usually happens is the soldiers typically get tons of weapons and do lots of direct damage. And then uh, the more magic heavy ones like the adept, um, they will use really light weapons and do most of their damage using these biotics. Um, so you spec that out before you play. So you don't even know if you do it on random, you don't know what enemy you're going to be facing. Um, which can make an interesting challenge, and they actually reward you for that by giving you a bonus and experience if you play on random rather than, oh, I want to play the Reapers, or oh, I want to play against the Cerberus guys. Um, but if you know what enemy you're going, you can really stack your, your team to, to crush them. Maybe not on gold difficulty, but certainly on silver. So when, when you play as random, is there a loadout, a cooperative loadout that you can mount as a team which can mostly handle everything, or are you going to find some situations where you'll be at a, you know, a definite disadvantage? Um, I think the where you'd have the most disadvantage is actually... So I think that uh, Cerberus is probably the easiest um, uh, enemy to fight. Um, okay. But you can be at the biggest disadvantage against them if you don't have anything that takes out, uh, I think it's shields. See, the shields are armor, which get, and there are a lot of things on Cerberus that have shield and armor. Um, so if you don't have anything to take that out, you're going to be at a little bit of a disadvantage. But it's not the kind of thing where it requires you to have a specific loadout. I mean, you can have something that's far below optimal, and you can do fine. Okay. Is it strictly sort of like a horde mode co-op, or are there specific sort of uh, missions or scenarios you go through? It's a lot like horde mode. It, so um, the way that it works is I think it plays over 11 consecutive rounds. You, one game is 11 rounds against the same enemy type with the same four people in your party or however many you have. You can even do it solo if you want to. Um, and the, the first... Let's see, four rounds are kind of straight bad guys coming in. In the first few rounds, it's really just the low-end guys, the really easy guys. Um, and then there are three levels kind of interspersed. I think it's like round round four, eight, and ten or something like that, um, where instead of just the objective is just to kill everyone, you have a, a more defined objective like in... Um, well, an example of an objective is like hold a certain spot on the map for a minute or, you know, go to these three different areas and um, and they're kind of peppered in there. But other than that, it's just kill, kill, kill. It's actually those objective ones, though, that are that can be really difficult, especially the ones where you're required to hold a specific spot on the map. I mean, we've that seems to be the place where we always die because um, they tend to pick spots on the map. And on each map, there's only like a couple of spots where the game will actually pick. Um, they're always horribly defensible. They're just 
out in the open. There's not a lot of cover, and um, you're just going to die. <laughs> but mm. just just to clarify something, when you say map, these are really just arenas, aren't they? There's no progression through. The, we go from the red section to the green section, or whatever it is. It, it is an arena. Yeah, that's right. Um, and they are all. I think they're all actually taken from parts of the single player game. So um, as you play through the single-player game, so a, a lot of people played the multiplayer demo of Mass Effect before Mass Effect 3 actually came out. Um, so you recognize these. I think there was only one or two levels that you could play in the demo. But then when you actually get to that point in the, um, the single-player game, you get this, oh, I know exactly where to go because I've played this level a hundred times. Um, and then you see that in all the other levels as well. There is, though... Um, a bit of a tie between uh, single player and multiplayer where you can, um, if you never play single player, it doesn't really matter. But if you play uh, multiplayer and you do well in it, you get these points towards, uh, I think it's called galactic readiness. And um, so the, the whole, I'm not going to reveal what the plot is of, of Mass Effect 3, but you need to get your readiness high. And once it's past a certain point, you can execute this thing in the in the single player um depending on how high your readiness is i think that determines either your chance of success or the losses you'll sustain while you do it so there actually is a link between the two which i think is kind of interesting sim you were talking about the darkness 2 i was indeed yes well we played a bit of uh, syndicate co-op as as you know and I discovered that after I finished and enjoyed the single player of the Darkness 2, the um, the co-op levels on that were a, were a similar kind of thing in that they ran sort of parallel to the overarching, you know, narrative of the single player. Although in this case, they reflected directly on events that you hear about in the single player game, and the co-op allows you to take the place of the people who um, partake in some of these events, and. Uh, it's slightly different in that you don't select your loadouts. Each of the four co-op characters has a unique talent, although mostly the unique talents are different ways of uh, dismembering and murdering people. I'm not sure if it forces you to play co-op in the same sense that Mass Effect 3 might do, uh, maybe just to get your galactic redness up. In this instance, it's more that you get a selection of missions, some of which can be played a single player so you can still go through the same levels and fight the same enemies uh, and you choose your difficulty level so it's not quite as challenging as other co-op games in that respect um, some of them are uniquely only playable uh, online with other players uh, and um, yeah there's a there's a whole co-op campaign or you can kind of individually play these these co-op missions after you've finished the single player so how long is the co-op campaign versus the single-player campaign? Okay, there are 18 to 20 individual co-op levels. Right. Uh, and they take place over, I think it's six different mini-campaigns, and each one's got sort of three missions in it. One of the three will be the one you can play on your own. One will be an unlockable one that you can play co-op or on your own. And the third one will be only available if you have other players playing with you. Uh, and I think that's an artificial restriction rather than a requirement because of the difficulty. I rented Syndicate and I put 25 hours into it or so, maybe a bit more, across the same maps again and again and again on, on different difficulty levels. Because the gunplay is dead on, the the sound effects are fantastic, you know, the movement is great. But I just wonder if you saw any similarities in gameplay or inspiration or, or anything at all really between Syndicate and The Darkness because of course they both have the same developer Starbreeze Yeah there, there was some def yeah I mean there were similarly restricted but quite open maps you know I mean Syndicate as you know had had pretty large levels and the the bits you played through in The Darkness 2 again were, were, were quite spread out mm. uh, I haven't played Mass Effect 3 you mentioned that they were essentially arenas but these do feel more like game levels mm. uh, so kind of relatively typical fps size stuff um, and there was the mix of skills which i think is less effectively done in in the darkness too um, but you you were able to help out your compatriots with your your darkness powers but it didn't have quite the same 
interconnected cooperativeness as syndicate where you have the you know the kind of healers and the the people who make your guns more powerful and all that kind of thing i yeah. Uh, th- there are some of those kind of squad buffs in the darkness too, uh, and you have to play to earn enough XP to unlock them. But I, I didn't find them quite as necessary. You certainly didn't have to have any of that um, buffing each other as you might do if you knew you were taking on the the Cerberus or some other faction from the from the ME3 co-op. Beyond the four characters and their four unique darkness weapons and powers, uh, you don't really have that same level of customization. Syndicate kind of flopped. Now, part of that is because of people like me who rented it. I would have bought it because it was down to £20, except that it's published by EA, so I just don't know when they'll take the servers offline. But it, it's a really, really good co-op game. But also, in the in the single player and the co-op, there's this nice mix of abilities you can get. In multiplayer in Syndicate, you don't have a, a skill tree, you have this grid. You can unlock any power on the grid that you want to. So I can go from the top left all the way to the bottom right, and I don't have to worry about going through a tree of any sort. The only incentive they have for you to build your things in a certain way is that they say if you pick two powers that are orthogonally adjacent, you'll get a permanent boost to your health. Not essential to do that. No, it's not essential. And then the second thing, and I think this is where it might be like Diablo 3 Lupus, is that each power you get, so for example, Sim, you know, you can get powers that take down enemy shields, they will then have sub powers. And so what you can do is you can give that you can make that ability last longer or make it more energy efficient or make it chain jump to, to, to affect other soldiers. The power of, of kind of the modifier dictates how much it costs uh, to buy. The least effective modifier will, will require one credit, for example, and the most effective one will require five credits. But if I have five credits, I can unlock the most powerful one and not have to bother about any of the rest. The best, absolute best thing about Syndicate is that everybody is a healer by default. No matter what you build, you will always stay as a healer, and you can heal people remotely. So you don't have to be next to them to get them. Are there, is there high ground in the game where if I'm not that good and I just jump in, I could say take up like a sniper position, but only to heal people who've fallen down? Okay, I think you have to be within a certain distance. Oh, okay. There's one level where I can see people fighting below me, and I can just look at them, and as long as kind of my reticule pops up, I can heal them and not be anywhere near them. And it awards you points for that, so there's a, there's a definite reward mechanic for it. Uh, there is a you have the capacity to heal any one individual person and you can specialize a bit more can't you enable to you can have a squad heal ability but yes n- no one's prevented from having that that function and it it works really well because it's rewarded as many points as killing somebody basically and if you if you heal somebody that's in your syndicate because you can start a syndicate and have a global ranking so i think hatchet job was 600th in the world or something you get more points for healing them in your syndicate and actually all the other powers that you have so if i want to electrocute somebody or slow them down or i just have to look at them and hold down the 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 power button right and i can keep on shooting and attacking as i do this talking about gears three and gears two you know in gears to to get somebody up you have to stand next to them and pick them up right in syndicate they have an area of effect at which point you can start getting them up so i can move in start getting them up, and then keep on moving and fighting and be completely motion and have full motion. Yeah, that's like uh, Gears 3 uh, in beast mode. If you're the Cantus, you've got this area effect heal where uh, you score a lot of points by doing that. And the Cantus is, he can't crouch or anything, so he can't use a lot of cover, but he can stand back and heal, which makes him pretty effective. In Syndicate, it's quite easy to go in a game when you're low level and the other people will just hammer through it and kill everything. But it doesn't matter because you're still healing them and getting XP, so you always have something to do. And it rewards you uh, a percentage of what damage you do manage to do to things as well. So it, it doesn't you don't go without XP if you just manage to land a few bullets. Although it, it isn't very generous in that regard. Sim, you played a lot of dead island yeah when you said earlier that um you know we should think about things that ought to be included in other co-op games uh, dead island has a particularly good mechanic where uh, initially like most um co-op games if you think of borderlands for example once you get to the point where you've invited another player in who isn't very near to your own level uh, those people are going to get murdered 
fairly regularly mm. uh, and because they're just underpowered compared to how the game levels the enemies. Whereas once Dead Island was patched, what they did was um, allowed any level player, so you could have a level 1 player and a level 50 player playing co-op, and it dynamically levels the enemy to whichever player is looking at it on the screen. So if I was a level 1 player, then I would be fighting level 1 zombies, and they would have health, you know, consummate with being level 1. But if I hit it with a a weapon that would take 50% of its damage of its health away and I was playing with a level 50 player then on their screen that percentage of health would also be taken away so it, you could have any up to the four co-op players you're allowed you could have any number of people at different levels and they'd do a, a percentage amount of damage you know consummate with with what the enemy would be versus them and it was just so neat because it immediately took away that that problem of not being able to play with your friends if they've put, invested a lot more time in it than you have. So for that, what's the incentive for leveling up? Like, What, what joy do you get for leveling up if you're going to be just as effective in combat as someone who's much lower level? Yeah, that's interesting. It was, a, it was an option, actually, so you could turn it on or off. Um, the incentive is that as well as increasing in the amount of damage they do the weapons tend to have better features as you get higher level and, and better statistics. Um, the, the weapons are notoriously easy to destroy uh, just through wear and tear in, uh, in Dead Island. But as you leveled up, um, there was a whole skill tree uh, which allowed you to do various things with your characters alongside the weapons you could use. So I guess it became more about specializing than just increasing the statistics. Oh, I see. That's interesting. That with, um, with Borderlands, since you mentioned that, I actually liked that version as well, where yep. uh, their version of, of the level mismatch idea, where um, you, c- you might get slaughtered if you're lower level, but you also get a whole lot more experience for damaging and killing those enemies. So... There's, it's sort of a rubber banding effect. If you're, if you're lower level, you can get brought right up to a higher level pretty quickly if you're playing with other people at a high level. Definitely. But the problem with Borderlands is, is that it, there's kind of an incentive to start new characters because otherwise you can't play with people. But then you have this terrible situation where you're having to start new characters to play with people. Right, yeah. because yeah. Borderlands is set up to where you get loot and you get guns and you want to keep those guns if you've gotten a good one. Yeah, it's really almost just so you can experience the other character classes that that you would want to, you know, create new characters. I loved Borderlands, but that really was fucking annoying. For, conceptually, the apogee of the of design that we've talked about in this game is Dead Island, where anybody can play with anyone, no matter what the level is, and you don't get more powerful as you level up. The incentive is to be able to experiment and to try and to specialize. Yeah, I like that idea. Now, Lupus, you've been playing Diablo three. Right, and I believe a lot has been made actually of the way that the 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 skill and modification styles have changed since Diablo two, and also the emphasis on experimentation now. Yeah, it's it's a pretty big shift since uh, the last Diablo game, which was more of the traditional uh, skill trees, and the new Diablo three is uh, much closer to what sounds like Syndicate has, where there's your skills. And you have a almost sort of skill palette to choose from, as well as a number of modifiers for each skill at your disposal. You have about six different categories of skills to pick from, and each of those individual categories has a handful of skills. Uh, it varies depending on your class. And then each of those individual skills has about five what they call runes, which are modifiers for each of those skills. Currently, I'm playing as a monk. A lot of my skills that I'm using, anyways, are defensive nature, where I'll either shield or heal, but then I am using the modifiers to either get more survivability out of them. For instance, the shield that I can pop up also has now a secondary healing effect. Uh, I could choose from either like extending the ability turning it into damage reflection. Like, my healing uh, skill that I have also gives me a damage buff now. You have, like, 
this nice big set of skills that you do have to level in order to unlock all of them. To me, it almost feels like building uh, sort of like a collectible card game deck. Yeah. It's where you, we have this larger set of skills or larger set of uh, options, and you're, you're narrowing it down to just a, a select few that you feel has some sort of uh, synergy. Like the monk has a, a few abilities that pull enemies towards them, and then you have another ability that can blast them away, stunning them. So something I'm not clear about is you say that you have to, once you unlock all the skills, then you're called to experiment with this palette. But you also say that each different character type, so monk or wizard or lollipop lady, whatever it is, <laughs> has has their own set of stuff to fuck about with. Can I then say, okay, I'm, I'm, I've hit skill progression level 15 with my monk, I'm bored of this, I want to respec, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my skill progression level 15 and put it into a warrior. That would be cool, but unfortunately you can't do that. But... Let's say you have 25 abilities that you have currently have unlocked or so. For the warrior. For your warrior that you have. Any six of those you could be using at any given time. And you're not, you're not locked into using those for all time. I'm just kind of wondering why there's this reticence to allow people to just wholeheartedly respect their characters and say, you've already put the time into earning this stuff. We're going to let you just take all the time that you've invested and just pour it into a different character. I agree with you. I see what you're saying because that's your time that you put into the game. Like you shouldn't have to put all that time in again if you kind of want to test out the barbarian, and or if you, the barbarian would be better against a certain uh, dungeon or an enemy in Diablo three. You know why can't I just go back and put all of my uh, we'll just call it time instead of respect put all my time into a different character? Yeah, that would certainly be great. Um, Mass Effect has a kind of an interesting way to deal with that also. Um, you can't respect a character. So in, this is in the, the multiplayer. Um, you level up your characters. They can be up, go up to level 20, I think. Every time you level up, you get skill points to spend on your various skills. And mm. each character has, I think, five different skill paths that you can level up. Um, so you can't respect on there until you get a respect card. And you get a respect card by buying it, oh, not Jesus. with not with like Xbox Live points, but with you know the mm. the money that you gain throughout the game. Or of course, you can actually buy it with real dollars if you if you're so inclined. <laughs> yeah, of course. Really? Okay. Microsoft <laughs> makes it easy to do that. Bloody um, hell. So what's funny is that I have like five respect cards, and I never want to use them because I don't have that many high level characters that I want to you know just completely respect, but. You know, I have friends that they're dying for a respect card because they, you know, they they made one small error in how they spec'd out mm -hmm. their character, and now they can't get that like last, uh, the last progression on on that tree and that skill, um, and so they just have to wait or just play a ton in order to get enough money to get these fairly rare respect cards. That's terrible. Agreed. Well, they could always make the Bioware auction house. And then take a cut of you selling your respect card to your friend. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's funny. So the people that I play with are always saying, why don't they just allow trading of this stuff? Because, you know, I like to have certain kinds of weapons, and I, I hardly ever use... Uh, well, I never use SMGs, kind of because they're shitty in that game. Um, but, you know, I like using the sniper rifles, and the shotguns are really good. But I have tons of SMGs, and they're kind of useless for me. So why can't I give that to someone else? That's the wrong question. The, the question is, why the fuck have they got a system where there's an incentive for you to buy a fucking respec card? <laughs> they right. built that system just so that you can buy the respec cards. Yeah. yeah. So that Crouton's <laughs> friends can go, oh, God, I want a respec card. I want a respec card. Oh, you know what? It's less than a sandwich. Oh, it's not as much as French fries from McDonald's. And I'll play the game for X yeah. amount of years and buy one. It's... It's actually not as good as that because the respect card, you can get money, but you buy money on these kind of random packs, kind of like buying magic cards or something. So you don't know that you're going to get a respect card. It's, oh, in fact, man. it's a rare card, so you're, gonna, you're not likely to get it. And since they've come out with new uh, DLC that, that has more and more stuff in those packs, potential things in those packs, your chances of getting the respect cards are probably less now than they were before. Now, wow, the way that they kind of... Yeah, I know, it's kind of shitty. One thing that you can do, though, is... 
once you reach level 20, you can retire. I think it's promote that character. And basically, you go back down to level zero. I don't know why they call it promoting, because you, cause you go back <laughs> down to zero. Um, and then you can basically start again and with the path that you want. Oh. That's, their, that's their take on respecking. Hmm. <laughs> but but it's, it's still a good game, I swear. There's a man called Universal Head. He designed board game rules. We did an interview with him. And before I knew anything about Mass Effect, because I hadn't been reading up on it, I said, you know what, come... and I said this as kind of wearing plastic devil horns and, and twizzling an enormous Victorian moustache. And I had a fucking monocle made out of orphan's tears. And I said, you know what companies should do? They should have rare packs like in Magic the Gathering, where they can sell you the chance to get weapons. Ha 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 Evil, 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 evil. <laughs> and then EA go and do it. Well, a joke for you is marketing genius if you work for EA Bioware. <laughs> You're just in the wrong industry. Yeah, that guy got a big raise when he came up with that idea. You know what he did? He listened to this podcast and stole it from you. Yeah, well done. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should sue him for the intellectual property for that idea. I'm, I'm here, EA, you into all that courtroom stuff. Oh, hang on. You better edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> Skeleton, this isn't the first time that you've heard about EA doing dodgy things with games, have you? Uh, absolutely not. No, you've had first-hand experience of this with, with an older title. Uh, just actually last weekend, I went to a friend's house, and we, I had some money left on a card for a video game store. And we went in there, and we just wanted to get some kind of just some fuck around like five dollar titles. Like that was the hard limit, five or six dollars on each game. And we just wanted to pick up like five or six games and just have something to uh, drink a little bit and have some fun over the weekend. So one of the titles I bought was Tiger Woods. I think it's two thousand nine or something like that. And we get home and we go to play it, but I was not able to play the whole game because you only have five courses unlocked for for multiplayer in the beginning and you have to go through all of these single player events in order to unlock the the rest of the courses which is pretty much the the bulk of what a tiger woods game is when you go to uh see what it takes to unlock one of these games it says you know beat anika soren stam in the tiger challenge mode or give us a dollar of real money and we'll let you play it right now <laughs> So it's like a slap in the face, kind of. It's like you bought this game, and we'll say that I bought it brand new because it, I'm sure it works the same way in the newest Tiger Woods game. But then in order to actually play the entire game, you have to either give us more money or invest more time. Like you can't just get down, sit down, and play with your family or your friends on the entire game that you bought that you have on this disc. You're just <laughs> not able to access and as far as I'm aware, it was the same for for new purchases of 2000, Tiger Woods 2009, because I went onto a forum and I looked, and somebody had written in capital letters, I bought this to play with my family, and <laughs> now we can't. <laughs> Although, I, mean, I don't know that EA is, is solely responsible for that. I mean, they're, you know, they're huge. But um, if you look at a lot of the, the really inexpensive games on iPhone or iPad, Almost all of them now have what they call in-app purchases, and they're mm. usually things that you know. So you don't have to grind as long doing something. Yeah. You know, just make this thing shorter. You know, give us some more money and do it. <laughs> and they even rate those. Like if you go to the iTunes Store on the left-hand side on the app page, they'll say, "Oh, the top in-app purchases were." You know, so yeah. <laughs> like you don't have to feel bad about giving us money because look at all these other people that did too. <laughs> yeah, I don't buy those games. That's my rule. If I if I see a game and it says in in that purchases, I throw the iPad across the room in a fit of disgust, and I just don't buy them. Well, that's well, too bad because there's actually some really good ones out there. As long as you're willing to say, I'm just not going to spend any money. And also, of course, if the game is set up so that you know, there, I'm sure there are games where they make it really difficult for you to get through it without you know without throwing in frustration or purchasing these packs. But there's a lot of other ones that are that are not bad at all without having to buy like like um draw something like you don't have to you don't have to spend an extra dollar on that is this a similar model to the one that facebook games use i mean i don't really use it but i recently dabbled on a facebook game um which was it was a great game but it required you to have certain items which you had to pay money for or to invest you know more time than anyone reasonably could in something you're fiddling around with in your browser that's definitely sort of the free-to-play model of course sure yeah 
And I don't think that the free-to-play model is really that bad because, like, in, say, a game like Team Fortress 2 that went free-to-play um, just a while ago, most of the things that you can buy for that game are cosmetic. And that's kind of okay, but when it's selling either a chunk of the game when you've already paid full price or when it's a game where you can't go any further in this game unless you you kind of buy something, then that's when it starts to... Uh, kind of fall on the other line, like the where I won't cross that line. I, I won't get into those. I don't have anything against free-to-play. I, I don't really have anything against in-app purchases because there's a discussion there to be had about what is the cost of the game. If it's free-to-play or it's $1, I think that's fair enough. But we have to spend some time thinking about what we spend our money on. And I think also it would make sense for the games companies to think about the free-to-play model and how it changes because really, at least think about multiplayer shooters the free to play model is here is the arena in which you fight here is your avatar and then you can pay us for weapons and i think a much better model one that i would prefer is here is your avatar here is all the gameplay affecting stuff for free but you buy the maps now they can design it so that some maps are you know, some maps are better for some weapons, for sniper rifles, or some maps are better for vehicles. But you buy, you pay for the experience you want. You don't pay to experiment. I don't know. I th- in a multiplayer setting, that can suck. Because I remember having that happen in, like, the Halo 2 days, I think, when someone didn't buy a map pack. And it's like, oh, I guess we're not playing that because, you know, one one fourth of our party doesn't have it. Uh, it's better if there's just, you know, you're out of weapon or something. Not that that's great either. Well, no, it, it, it isn't actually, it's because how much social pressure is there to buy the map if all your friends are playing it? There's yeah, quite a I bit. Think... I've seen it firsthand in Gears of War 3. Yeah, I do it all the time. Like, if if my friends are playing, and, and it's not just maps, like, if my friends are playing this game, I'm just going to go get that game because that's where my friends are and that's how we do it. And how much social pressure is there to buy a weapon if you're already playing the game with them? I don't think there's any social pressure, but there's gameplay pressure. Because if you want to be good at the game, you've got to buy more stuff for the game. Exactly. Because your enjoyment is predicated on your ability to compete, partially. And if you cannot compete, or if you are being beaten by somebody who has an advantage that you don't have, because you know it's, an, it's a recession, you don't have the money to pay for it, you're you're going to be annoyed by that experience. It's not going to be fun. Social pressure is saying, we're having a great time. Can you find the money for this? And weapon pressure is, this fucking twat's beating me because he's, he's bought something that I don't have or they made it too difficult for me to get. Right. Like, I think that purchasable weapons and items uh, should only be cosmetic and they shouldn't have any kind of different gameplay functionality than one that you already get in the game. But I think this is a neat segue into a larger discussion about what we should think about before we buy games. Because I am I don't really want to buy Mass Effect 3. I, I wouldn't mind playing the single player, but I don't really want to buy Mass Effect 3 because I don't, I don't agree with what EA are doing. Okay, Lupus, you bought Diablo 3, but you that's essentially investing in a game and voting for a model that says here is a single player content that you cannot have access to if the servers go wrong or if your internet can internet connection goes down and internet connections go down tell us about your purchasing decision for Diablo 3 did you think about it did you consider not being able to play the single player or did you just think it's been it's been coming for 12 years I don't really care I'm going to treat myself oh well to me it hasn't been it's not as much an issue for me because I wasn't really planning on playing it strictly as a single player game to begin with I I purchased it as a Mm. game to play with with some of my friends we were all going in together, you know, picking it up so we could play uh, co-op and plow through it together. So the single player wasn't as much a priority for me. It it has been an annoyance. The server issues, whatnot, uh, they have gotten significantly better since the first few days. It's been somewhat akin to an MMO launch. So the first few days, the first week was pretty rough. Uh, Since then, I haven't had any issues yeah, it's been a ma- it's a, it's a matter of give and take, at least for what they're gunning for, because they're expecting to have the real money auction house and all this. They really need. I mm, go ahead. This is incredibly condescending of me, but it seems to me if you're designing a system 
that you know people are going to be ex- exploit and they have done before and there's an incentive to do that and in doing so you end, uh, actually end up with the worst experience for the customer which is what having an online only game can lead to especially if you have bad servers that design isn't very good that gameplay design isn't very good it's not really a gameplay design though is it it is a way of monetizing it and that probably says more about the I, I mean we talked about EA briefly and how they were evil and so on but I'm sure that somebody representing them would you know I'm not saying they are evil they'd argue that you know th- these people have to make money and that, that it's more difficult to make money in the current games industry especially given the kind of investment you've probably had to make if you've made Diablo 3 or something on a similar scale hmm well, it's going to be really difficult to make money when I stop buying Tiger Woods games because I only get half the fucking game. Well, I, I agree. No, I agree with that. You know, and I, 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 as Gaff said, you know, he was not sure about whether he wanted to buy Mass Effect Three. He's sure he wants to play the single player, but it's, um, you know, it's one of those things that's going to end up on a rental list, isn't it? Or something you're going to be so pissed off about, you're just not going to spend money on at all. And I, like you, I've certainly been a few games over the last few years where. I've either not bought them at all or waited until they're kind of pocket money. I mean, obviously, you waited for Tiger Woods until it was <laughs> pocket money, and then it, it was still a massive rip-off. But... Syndicate, I mentioned Syndicate. I would have bought Syndicate, apart from another EA issue, which is they turn off their servers. Agreed. Yeah, the Tiger Woods 2009 servers are off. Where are they expecting the market to go? Are they assuming that because there's a recession, people just buy things piecemeal? Yeah. Because essentially what they're saying is, you're going to be paying full price for a game whose content you cannot access. You will not be sure if any of our decisions were based on gameplay, i.e. we want the best experience for you, or based on how we can get the most money from you. Surely they'll expect you to go to Tiger Woods 2010. Yeah, we're going to turn their servers off because we know the next logical step for you is to buy the brand new game so that they can turn their servers off in two years. Is the market going to keep on tolerating it? I, I, I think they're for probably AEA trying to probably find will. out. Uh, well, yeah, look because at, they're look so at, large. Yeah, and also they have they have all those sports titles, and oh, I think a lot of people buy those those sports titles. You know, they're not following video game news, so they're not going to know. Oh, you know, this this game had this problem, and you know, so you shouldn't really buy those. I think people are going to see it in the store and say, "Oh, I know that guy on the cover of that video game. I'm going to buy that for my kids." Yeah, but it's going to end up with a sports title that they buy. NFL, whatever it is, 2019, and then they have to pay extra to, to attach a man's foot so he can run. <laughs> or you get 25 of the teams and you got to unlock <laughs> the other five teams. You want to get a fourth down, pay extra. I think wow. the, uh, the foot attaching game is already more interesting than Madden. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there should be a sport-based sports game where you just create your character and see how he runs. In American football. <laughs> That that'd be fantastic. Oh, uh, have you have you ever played Blood Bowl? Oh, don't 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 mention that, Lupus. Why? Why? <laughs> oh, a spore based Blood Bowl game would be oh, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I have played Blood Bowl. It's a great idea, marred by a terrible rule set. <gasps> what? What's this? What? Which rule set are we talking about? Not the original one, surely. I'm, I'm talking about the rule set that had a group of experienced gamers saying, oh, well, if it's a summer solstice, then the ogre can bring his tax reduction in for 3% to go to this square. And one game took five and a half hours, and I wasn't even playing. <laughs> I was just watching it. The person I play with said, oh, we'll start a Blood Bowl League. We'll just see how it goes. Okay, fair enough. Sounds interesting. I picked vampires because they sounded cool. Interesting thing about the vampires is they're incredibly deadly, but they have a chance of attacking and killing their own team. So that's kind of how they're balanced. But the rule set is just awful. You have to figure out if you can do this and then who's damaged and how much you can trade them for. And it becomes a fucking accounting exercise. And and the Xbox version is terrible as well. I think that uh, Games Workshop, who makes Blood Bowl... Um, at least, not maybe not for the video games, but for their board games, they're kind of like the EA of board games. Yeah. In that, like they occasionally they'll put out something really good, but then they won't support it. Um, like Space Hulk was a fantastic game, and they you know had a really limited print print run. It was like a hundred bucks to buy, um, but you could buy Warhammer stuff, and the rule the rule sets suck. But like you know you have to buy more and more stuff all the time. They're kind of the same thing. 
I've had an idea. I hope that EA is listening. I suggest that EA start making very complex RPGs, <laughs> right? And uh, you pay people to remove complexity. If you if you just buy the vanilla game, it takes uh, ten presses of a button and then a complicated kind of mini game to be able to access your inventory. But if you pay a dollar, uh, you can just access your inventory normally for an hour or so. That w- that would <laughs> engender God. hatred around the globe. That's horrible. You're a bad person for thinking it. And for suggesting it to them, because you know what happened last time you suggested something. <laughs> Perhaps they can make a really complicated game and then charge you $2 to watch the tutorial video like a, uh, like a tutor to teach you actually how to play the game. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Uh, or $2 to skip all of it, I don't know, depending on which. There's a, there's a game we, which I must do, we must do a quick look of called DLC Quest, which is an Xbox Live Indie title. And when you play it... Um, there's no sound until you pay for an in-game money. <laughs> and, as, and there's no jumping animation either. <laughs> this could, so, could be the future. I was recently reading about a, a game called TIE Fighter, I think, or, or X-Wing, which is by Fantasy, Fantasy Flight Games. They are kind of the Activision of the board game world in that they have enormous clout and they produce very slightly produced games and uh, they get big licenses, so they have a Star Wars license. And this is a game where you move little fighters model fighters about and shoot at each other and i was confused by one of the things that they were advertising in the game which i thought that they were selling a uh, combat dice so dice you resolved you roll to resolve combat that had different stats compared to the base game one and it turned out i was wrong they were just selling different colored dice but they were the way they were pitching it is they said that this dice these dice will make your game go faster so essentially what they were saying is you mean because there's more of them because there's more of them, <laughs> which is actually a usability decision. So there's a there's a cost one there. Of course, they don't. You know, if as long as you can play the game, do you need more sets of dice? But then there's a question of if you if you can put them in, and it makes the game better. Should you do that? And I was wondering what is kind of the baseline we should accept for what should be in a game? Is it a shitty thing to only have one set of dice if you can play the game? Yeah, because dice aren't that expensive to produce, and you've wouldn't already you, made the dice for them. Would it have to be these specific dice? I mean, if you were a board gamer, wouldn't you kind of perhaps already have a collection of dice anyway? Or are they a unique number of sides or something? I think they're specific dice. Well, you know what this sounds like to me? is It sounds like a console video game came out, and the creators found a way to make the game uh, just slightly more user-friendly and a little bit better. And instead of putting a patch out for the game, they're making that dlc instead yeah sorry i th- i take a more cynical approach to that it sounds like they know like what's the one thing that can't be easily replaced in this game let's hold some of that back and then give it up later like i i doubt that it was so much of a use like they're, they're, i'm sure they thought okay in in play testing they have an infinite number of dice at their disposal so it's not like they have just a couple <laughs> they've got a whole room <laughs> I just imagine enormous warehouses full of dice with the FFG staff just going roll around. Right. So they'll be like, Hank, give me another fistful of dice. We need to test this thing. And then they, they make the decision on, you know, how many do we send it with? And it was at that point that the guy's twirling his mustache. He's like, well, the right number would be eight, but we can squeeze a little bit more if we can do, you know, two. So to be fair to FFG, I think this is how it's working. I'm not suggesting they are not giving you enough dice. I believe that if you need six dice in the game, they give you six dice. It's just that they're selling extra pairs and saying the game, literally the game plays, assuming that smoother gameplay and faster gameplay is better, the game plays better with the extra dice. The idea that you had before, though, where you could buy extra dice, uh, not just extra, but different dice that have different stats, that was actually a game. Quarrier? Yeah, I think that's it. And also, I think Wizards of the Coast had dragon dice way back. So here's the thing, because Serlin, David Serlin, whose whose views I respect, and who is um, a, a video game and board game designer who doesn't like people buying power or having to spend money to acquire game playabilities, right? Although he's okay with fighting games selling characters. He's got a Kickstarter for puzzles for one of his games called Puzzle Strike. I think it's over. And in the Kickstarter, it said, if you support this game you will get these abilities that aren't in the base game and i was kind of thinking oh i'm not sure about that but of course with a board game 
everybody has access access to those abilities at the same time. The problem with selling weapons is that is the asymmetry because we're playing remotely. If a board game was going to sell extra dice, I don't really have an issue with that as long as there are enough dice for everybody to be able to use them equally, if that makes sense. And that's a good point because when you're playing a board game, you can't play it really. I mean, I guess if you both have a copy and you play it over Skype or something, you could play it in remote locations. But usually mm. it's a bunch of people at one table. So if, if you do buy the extra set of dice, it's for everybody. Yeah. As opposed to, say, if I'm playing Battlefield 3 and I buy uh, a new gun or something like that, I'm the only one who gets that gun. Uh, it's also much more easy to modify a game on the fly when it's just a board game that you're sitting around versus something you're playing online. Yes and no. You can have an honor system. If you're playing with friends and you decide that, well, Steve Steve has divorced his multimillionaire wife and now he's got lots of money, he's decided to buy all the unlocks of Battlefield 3, <laughs> you, can ask, you can ask Steve not to use them all. And as long as Steve's wife's money hasn't gone to his head, he might agree. But it's when you're playing with randoms that, of course, the issue arises. And this is, might be going off on a slight tangent, but I think you kind of brought it up a little bit, where um, it's never a good thing to keep playability away from a player at first, because uh, one of the reasons I, I couldn't enjoy Battlefield 3 as much as I wanted to was because um, you could be outside in a level and somebody is shelling you with mortars. Now, unless you've, unless you've invested time in the game and un- un- unlocked the mortars... You can't really do anything back to him. I mean, you can you can get up there, you can sneak up, and you can shoot him. But if he's well protected with people in front and he's shelling you, it, it makes it so much harder because you don't even have access to set up a mortar guy in the back because you haven't played the game as much as this other person has played it. I my ideal shooter is like something like uh, Battlefield uh, 1942 or 43, I think it was on XBLA, where yeah. you only have three loadouts. You can't get any different weapons, so everybody who is infantry has the same weapon. It puts everybody on even, and then if you're just better at that game, you will prevail most of the time, as opposed to if somebody has a different weapon, uh, he may prevail. When you were talking about um, unlocking guns versus unlocking maps and the, you know the different incentives that players might have to choose one of those things, and obviously you know we talked about Steve and his millionaire divorce settlement, uh, where he could actually afford to buy all the maps of Battlefield 3. But there is a, a degree of peer pressure there, which is kind of reinforced by the way the game's structured. So you're removed from the server now in Battlefield 3 if you haven't got the the, uh, the Back to Carcan, the currently existing DLC. And I guess the same thing will happen with the you know the four new pieces as well, which are all going to be 1,200 uh, Microsoft points. So, so you know, you're investing the price of another game if you want to stick with all the maps from from here on in. And I'm um, I'm wondering whether the power of peer pressure is kind of more likely to make people buy it than just the thought of having to have the maps in in and of themselves, because it's it's a lot of money. I think the peer pressure has to be applied in the right way. So I think it would make more sense for the games to say, if this is a universal download, for example, where everybody has to have the maps for some reason, not that I agree with that, people forcing you to download content you can't have access to, but if they say uh, you have four plays of this map remaining, then maybe that will be enough, or maybe that will make you think, actually, I had quite good fun on that, and they did let me play it, so I'm going to buy it now. That might be more of an incentive to... yeah. Although I think it would be difficult to uh, to deploy because there's always going to be people that, oh, they got into this one map and everyone just quit immediately and it counted against them. So they'd have to constantly be, de- be dealing with complaints like that that I'm sure they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to. <laughs> Something that old school Soviet said, uh, and this ties into other people wanting games to force you to play together, is in Monster Hunter, even if you fight the monsters, you can lay traps and so on, so you can contribute, okay? So it gives you a non-killing thing to do, which is quite cool. Uh, The problem with Monster Hunter is that it segregates people by level. So at some point, I simply won't be able to go on missions with you because you are too high level. What I would like to see more of in games are those experiences that do force you to play together, but they don't force you to play together because of difficulty. 
which is actually what kind of forced co-op means because it's we cannot kill this person unless you we all shoot at him at the same time or we use our various abilities using the same mechanics as normal now in lost planet 2 and in monster hunter try there are levels where you are on a train with a gun and on a ship trying to kill a monster respectively and the force cooperation in there is that one person has to aim the gun or aim the catapult another person has to go and get ammunition for the gun a third person has to load it and then in lost planet 2 you also have to keep an eye on the uh, the, the engine overheating and maybe put out fires and so it's kind of putting you in a very simple way into at least in lost planet into a kind of a, a battleship situation where you are the, you are a gun crew on a warship and so it's co-op, but it's removing it from the standard things that you do. And I would really like to see more of that in games because I I felt I had a job to do. You know, I had a role to play uh, that was quite different to anything I'd done before. And I, I don't know how it would work. I mean, what would that be like in The Darkness 2, Sim? Each person plays a tentacle? Uh, I suppose if you were looking at it as being all part of the same mechanism in the way that Lost Planet 2 does it, uh, then... Mm. Yeah, I mean, there are two arms and two tentacles, so you could presumably have four-player co-op with one person yeah, in control of each limb. Five-player co-op, because one person would control the body. I, I, of course, yes. Yeah. I mean, in, in a way, when you play the single player of The Darkness 2, it, it kind of feels like the two demon arms are personalities of their own anyway, and they, they kind of allude to them being of differing tempers and that sort of thing. They don't have conversations with each other, but th- mm. there are certain parts in the game where they're, you know, where they are kind of separated up into into constituent parts. And the game goes through, you know, it goes to that age-old thing of disarming you as as many many games do. And it it goes through phases of taking away your normal gun weapons and taking away your darkness weapons. So, I guess Perhaps those things are individual enough, but would it be interesting enough to just be in control of, in an FPS setting, of of one limb, if somebody else was doing all the running around? I played the uh, Steel Battalion demo recently. Uh, I don't own Connect, but somebody kindly lent it to me. Uh, And it struck me that you're thrust there into the role of the pilot and AI um, NPCs take the positions of your your gunner and your driver and, and that kind of thing and that mm. uh, that struck me as a hugely missed opportunity uh, for something which you know perhaps would have made a similar co-op experience to the one you're describing where you all take responsibility for for one thing rather than just helping to uh, gang up on things to kill them it's, it's just just made me think sim that in first person shooters occasionally you will play a projectile because you'll control a rocket. Yep. I wonder why co-op games aren't about instead of controlling people, you're you're controlling. You are. It's an EA strapline. You are the bullet, <laughs> or you are the spell. Maybe it's just not complicated enough. I could fire you, Sim, from my gun. Yeah. And you could go into a crowd and decide when to detonate or when to do certain things. Now you say it's not complicated enough, but mini games are reasonably popular. So it's not the complexity; it's the speed at which you do. In a frantic co-op game, for example, you, you you are a figure, you are an avatar, and then you die. You then <laughs> you then become a grenade, whatever it is, and you're hopping between things, doing different things. Or maybe you are a particle effect. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the the biggest problem in there would be from a uh, developmental like gameplay standpoint is making all aspects of it roughly the same amount of enjoyment. Because if you're just the guy who all you have to do is squeeze the trigger and the other guy gets to do all the fun stuff like burrowing through somebody's head or something like that, <laughs> then one person is going to be bored. It's like, okay, I'm going to fire you now. And the other guy's like, wee, here I go. I'm killing people. You know, So it, it'll be difficult to, to have everything on kind of like an, an even platform. If somebody could create a game where say you are like say in a submarine or something and you have you all have a specific job that would be really interesting well there's artemis isn't there what is that right artemis as far as my way is pretty much star trek the bridge the game in that uh one person plays a captain and he has a screen and then you have engineering and you have ops and they have their own screens so you can play over the internet or over LAN, and you're doing these individual roles 
But when when there's not any orders given, what do you do? If you're if you're Chekhov or whoever. Uh, well, I suppose you still have to have stuff to monitor. I've never played it, but I imagine you would still have stuff to to kind of keep an eye on feedback about. In the same way that in Syndicate, although I'm not killing people, I'm always looking at people's health. Well, that sounds completely awesome for like say like a party setting, something like that. Yeah. Also sounds way too fucking nerdy for me, but it's <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like like almost like a rock band party game for the non musical set. You mean where each person could specialize in whatever they like doing? Yeah, where they kind of portray themselves as like this, uh, you know, like like this hero of theirs. Like for a rock band is for people who grew up on like uh, classic rock music and, and they've always just wanted to, you know, kind of get a little bit of taste of what it's like to hold that guitar and play. And this is for the set that's grew up on like Star Trek or something and they want to know what it's like to be in number two spot or whatever their names are and uh you know like the guy who want to know what it's like to be the navigator on the enterprise things like that that's a much more flexible model isn't it then well i mean you could have okay cooking mama what if cooking mama was cooking restaurant and you had one person taking orders one person doing the pizza dough another person watching the oven that would be good but i think that that might be too mundane because you can actually do that and get paid for it it's got to <laughs> be something like uh that's not work Exactly, something that you can't go down the street and do. Oh, I remember there was a, a PC game that I don't actually know if it was made, but I remember this was back when I was really following video game news. I was getting PC Gamer and stuff like that. Is that even still a magazine? I don't know. Um, so yes. there was this game that was coming out that sounded amazing. So each person could have a different role where... Uh, you could be just like a grunt, an infantry person, and it's first-person shooter. Or you could be this general who's not really in the game themselves, but they're looking at strategic maps, and they can see where all the resources are. Whereas if you're the person on the ground, you have very um, detailed information in a very limited scope. The opposite is true for the general, where they have... Uh, not as detailed information, but a, a much larger scope. And that general directs all of the, the troops. And I think that there are various levels of officer in between. And I'm saying officer in general. They, they weren't really that. They were something else. But um, where there are different scales of, uh, of scope and detail. And I think that's a really cool idea. And I'm sure that part of it would simulate what it's like to be in the military, um, especially a long time ago when communication wasn't as, as um, seamless it is, as it is now, like in the Civil War or something where they used flags and things to, to communicate. That could be an interesting model. Cruton, I've got it. I've got a way to integrate your idea with my idea, which is that you have people playing officers and grunts, uh, and then the other cop bit is you have people playing ticks and mites. So in the trenches, I get to play a tick, and I have to burrow into your head. <laughs> and then it's all connect, so I can be the guy who waves the flags. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds horrible. That's, the cool, that, <laughs> that's pretty much the quality of connect games we've got at the moment. We've just made the worst game ever. <laughs> C Civil War tick. <laughs> Civil War tick for Xbox Connect. <laughs> yes. Coming soon, Cockroach DLC. <laughs> you got to get on the ground, it. on your floor, and crawl as yes. the cockroach. Avoid the light. Do you want to avoid gangrene? That will be $10. <laughs> <laughs> All of my life I've been alone And I've always been the one Who was far from home I'm unknown And now I'm almost 40 years old I got a house down the road It's enclosed in stones All of my days have been a struggle From working to the hunger To the money to the mother's own I feel like I'm just gonna get old And have nothing left to show But a broken soul I'm trying to get closer to God, but I don't Cause my pride won't allow me to stop loving spite Cause every time I bust in this life I spill buckets from my eyes and I cuss the sky Can 
can I hold on? Tell me, can I roll on? I don't know, cause I felt low for so long. My mama told me not to settle for what I don't want. But I keep on holding on to ropes until my hope's gone. I'm like a soldier, I keep fighting till I float on. My eyes stay open, but I'm tired cause I've been woke long. I try to control it, but my mind is only so strong. Now I'm just choking cause I'm dying in the smoke. I feel like it's floating cause my life is just a joke, dog. Got problems coping because my doctor is a moron. I hide society cause everybody's so wrong. And the sky ain't reliable unless you're blowing folk glow. The sky.